Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here, and there's some friends that are out there getting coffee, and they're going to be flooding in here, and I look forward to having them join us. This is a re really a wonderful opportunity to hear from Senator Hatch. Um, and, I, and Senator, thank you. I, I, I know the demands on your time uh, to be able to come and join a, a, a think tank and share some views in the policy community is very valuable for us. And I want to say a personal thank you to you. I, I had the privilege of working in the Senate, but not, not for you. Uh, and, but I, I've had a chance to watch your stewardship through these years and want to say thank you for remarkable leadership for America. And we, we, we've greatly valued and needed that leadership, more now uh, than ever. Uh, colleagues, today, Senator Hatch is going to uh, speak with us about uh, the TPP. And everybody knows how important that is. Uh, I'm a defense guy. I, uh, I spent my career in and around the Defense Department. Strategic in my world means a bomber. <laughs> Okay, but that's not strategic. This is strategic. We're talking about something that's profoundly strategic, uh, and that is how is the, the Asian community going to be shaped to deal with cross-cutting horizontal problems? Is it going to be a structure that's based on rule of law, transparency, accountability of government, due process, or is it going to be the Wild West? And uh, it could go either way. It's profoundly in our interests that this work out uh, along the lines of the TPP, the vision that informs this. There is not enough appreciation of the strategic significance of TPP in either Washington or in this country. Senator Hatch does understand that, and that's why he's championing this. And we, uh, we have to, this stage, it's so important for the country. This can't be just simply submerged into kind of a, a tactical politics environment, because this is important for America's future. And I think Senator Hatch is prepared to be that champion to help us realize that there's a much larger reality that we have to appreciate and why it's so crucial for us to move this year. So, Senator, uh, all of us are very deeply grateful for you. I will I'll tell everybody here, the Senator has to get out of here because he's got to be up in the hill at 10 o'clock. So we're going to race him out the door. And so I better stop talking so you can hear him. With your applause, would you please welcome Senator Oren Hatch. I'm delighted to be with all of you here today, and uh, I hope this will be an interesting discussion. It should be because some of the most important things we do up there involve what we're going to discuss here today. I thank you, Dr. Hamry, for your kind introduction, and it's really an honor for me to be here today. Now, the Center for Strategic and International Studies is well known for its thoughtful analytical work in international economics. When they asked me to speak here, they said they were looking for someone who can not only help them fill that role, but also captivate an art audience with his charm, his wit, and his charisma. So I'm pleased to fill in while the search continues. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really a pleasure for me to be here. This is the first time in 38 years that I've been in, in this uh, institution. And I have always uh, respected it very, very much. Joe Jordan is a personal friend and a great man. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to come and talk with you uh, because I strongly believe in the power of open markets and international trade to grow economies. I believe in trade because it works. It, it certainly works in my home state of Utah, and it's a, Utah is a prime example. Despite its location, Utah is well integrated into the international marketplace. We export goods and services to 195 countries around the world, Utah has the highest percentage of foreign language speakers in the country, and 60% of our public school students study a foreign language in elementary or high, school, or high school. I think the reason we have such a facility with languages is because we have Mormon missionaries all over the world, now 95,000 of them, uh, growing and learning and, of course, learning languages. I have two of my grandchildren, one in Brazil and the other one in Chile. Chile serving on missions and speaking their languages fluently, both Portuguese and, and, uh, and Spanish. 
Our integration into the, local market, market, the global marketplace is uh, one reason for Utah's continued prosperity during its most recent economic downturn. In fact, Utah led the nation in five-year economic growth from 2007 to 2011. I might add international trade, especially with our free trade agreement partners, was a big part of our Utah success story. Utah's exports to U.S. free trade agreement partners boomed over the past decade, growing by over 225 percent from 2002 to 2012. The success of free trade agreements, or FTAs, as an element of economic growth is not limited, of course, to Utah. Statistics show that trade with our FTA partners provides more opportunities for American workers than trade with our non-FTA partner, partners. According to the, I'm so used to working with the FDA that I substitute it every once in a while. <laughs> According, and, and with good reason, if you look how they muff so many things. According to the Business Roundtable, U.S. trade with FTA partners supports 17.7 million American jobs. Since 2002, U.S. goods exports to countries with whom we have a free trade agreement in effect in 2012 increased by 110 percent. And these economic opportunities lead to higher paying jobs for our American workers. For example, jobs supported by international exports in the manufacturing sector pay on average 18 percent more than jobs not linked to trade. I'm often amazed when I think back on the role that uh, international trade has played in driving economic development across the globe over the past several decades. One of the most compelling pictures I have seen is the recent satellite photo taken of the Korean Peninsula by night. On the bottom half, you can clearly see the shining lights of South Korea, which exemplified the dramatic economic growth that that nation has enjoyed as a result of its long-term embrace of democracy and free trade. On the top half lies North Korea, cloaked in an almost total darkness as it remains economic, economically isolated from the rest of the world. And if you think each of those shining lights as representing a family, a business, or a community, it really brings home what trade means to the individual. I'm talking about food, warmth, security, and even individual opportunity. We can't forget that at the end of the day, economic decisions and trade are driven by individual choice. When we expand options through trade, we expand individual choice. So in essence, economic liberalization also fosters individual freedom. It increases opportunity choices and standards of living for people around the world. We know that the path to economic growth lies in open trade and economic freedom. When governments remove the constraints of unnecessary regulation and protectionism through trade negotiations, individuals are free to exchange goods and services in the most efficient way possible. These efficiencies liberate resources which can then be used in other more productive ways. This virtuous cycle generates growth, and that growth can continue to help lift millions out of poverty just, at as, all, just at as, as it has always done in the past. Since the end of World War II, the United States has played a leading role in promoting open markets, democracy, and of course the rule of law. We were a major proponent of the GATT and the Uruguay Round, which resulted in the creation of the rules-based World Trade Organization. We first embraced comprehensive bilateral free trade agreements with the signing of the U.S.-Israel free trade agreement over 25 years ago. And we created a new model for trade when we undertook comprehensive negotiations between developed and developing nations with the advent of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Since the negotiation of our first bilateral agreement, or should I say bilateral free trade agreement, we have now successfully concluded 14 free trade agreements with 20 countries around the world. And now the Obama administration is continuing the work of its predecessors in working toward a new model that would link existing free trade agreement countries with non-FTA countries to create an integrated marketplace. Now this ambitious undertaking known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, 
would bring together 12 like-minded nations, including some of the world's largest economies, like Japan, Canada, and Mexico, into a single agreement. As a group, TPP countries represent the largest goods and services export market for the United States. The potential for future expansion is embedded into the fabric of the negotiation as TPP parties have made it clear that upon conclusion of the negotiation, other nations are welcome to join if they are willing and able to meet the high standards the agreement envisions. Now, on the other side of the world, the U.S. is negotiating the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Part Partnership, or TTIP, which for the first time would further integrate the 28 countries of the European Union and the United States through a comprehensive free trade agreement. Again, if successful, this agreement would have a significant impact on the, on the world economy as, together, the United States and the EU generate over half of the world's economic output. Total goods trade alone between the U.S. and EU amounts to over $1 trillion a year. Investment flows represent another $300, $300 billion a year. And building on the strong trade relationship already in place with the European Union, a comprehensive agreement between the U.S. and the EU would set the standard in the global training, trading community for what a high standard trade agreement should look like. The administration also continues uh, efforts to negotiate a trade in services agreement, or TISA, with 50 of our WTO partners. Now, if successful, this agreement would cover 70 percent of the global services trade. So as you can see, there certainly is no shortage of ambition in our trade agenda. But still, key questions remain. Will any of these negotiations actually conclude? And if they do conclude, will they achieve the high standards that must be met for Congress to approve them? I have my share of concerns regarding these, uh, these questions. As we all know, it's easy to start uh, new projects, but hard to actually finish them. Too often, our initial enthusiasm for the new goal is overridden by other priorities or our unwillingness to actually do the hard work necessary to be successful. That is just as true for trade negotiations as, as it is in our personal lives. U.S. economic history provides abundant examples of failed trade negotiations. Often failure results when one of our trading partners lacks the commitment to make the hard political choices necessary to successfully conclude a trade agreement. But our history also shows that our inability to successfully conclude and implement trade negotiations can also be attributed to our own failures. A case in point is the Kennedy uh, round of negotiations undertaken under the auspices of the, of the GATT. In the Kennedy round, the members of the GATT had reached agreement on non-tariff barriers regarding customs valuation and anti-dumping. Both of these agreements required legislative action to implement, to, you know, for us to implement them in the United States. However, these non-tariff agreements went beyond the express limitations provided under Congress's prior grant of tariff negotiating authority. And as a result, Congress rejected the agreements. Today, the Obama administration is similarly undertaking comprehensive trade negotiations around the world without the authority of Congress. Now, that does not mean that Congress doesn't support, does not support, it doesn't mean that Congress does not support the ongoing negotiations. Many of us do. But it does mean that these complex negotiations are not currently authorized by Congress and that Congress has not formally anticipated the standards the agreement must meet in order to be approved. Of course, like the Kennedy Round, the executive branch is free to negotiate any agreement it sees fit. But also like the Kennedy Round, successful conclusion and implementation of such an agreement is on shaky ground. In January, I joined with Ways and Means Chairman Camp and former Senate Finance Committee Chairman Baucus to introduce the Bipartisan Congressional Trade Priorities Act. 
That legislation explicitly authorizes the executive branch to negotiate TPP and T TTIP as well as, as the trade and services agreement. Of course, the authorization is not limited to these agreements, nor is it limited to the administration. So if for some reason any of these negotiations fail, the United States has the ability to pursue other opportunities with different trading partners under this or a future administration. Importantly, the bill updates the congressional objectives for trade agreements, which are woefully out of date. The world and the economy of 2014 are very different from 2002, which is the last time Congress actually renewed Trade Promotion Authority, or TPA. The priorities articulated in our bill reflect extensive outreach with various stakeholders. As a result, these objectives are updated and modernized to reflect the way that business is conducted today. For example, the bill calls for trade agreements to address state-owned enterprises, requiring these entities uh, act solely on market-based considerations. The bill also recognizes the importance of trade in services and global value chains, which create benefits across all sectors of our economy. In addition, it requires that new trade agreements address currency practices. The bill also maintains and strengthens objectives seeking high standards of protection for U.S. intellectual property rights holders and advances trade negotiating, ne negotiating objectives for the digital age. As you know, our intellectual property is constantly being stolen all over the world, and especially in some areas of the world. And we've got to find some way of uh, restoring restraint in that area and, and restoring <coughs> protection for our intellectual property. And this nation is a very, very robust and good nation with regard to intellectual property interests. Our TPA bill goes further than 2002 by calling for an end to government involvement in intellectual property violations, including piracy and cyber theft of trade secrets. And the bill calls for elimination of measures that require U.S. companies to locate their intellectual property abroad as a market access or investment condition. The bill includes an expanded capacity building objective directing the administration to work with U.S. trading partners to strengthen not only their labor laws, as was provided for in 2002, but also their intellectual property rights laws. Many have complained the current TPA does, it, does not include the requirements on labor and the environment which were part of our recent trade agreements. Our bill addresses these objectives. Through the clear articulation of these objectives, the Congressional Trade Priorities Act sets forth the standards uh, an agreement must reach to be approved by Congress. In so doing, it empowers the administration to achieve those standards. We know that the administration is struggling to realize many of uh, the goals it has articulated for TPP, including high standards in market access, intellectual property, and the environment. Approval of the Congressional Trade Priorities Act will help our trade negotia negotiators achieve these goals by clearly stating what elements must be part of a trade agreement in order for it to obtain congressional approval. It also tells our trading partners that if they are willing to meet these higher standards, the agreement will be taken up by Congress and taken up expeditiously and without amendment, giving them the confidence they need to put our best offers, uh, their best offers on the table. Our bill also expands and enhances Congress's role in ongoing international trade uh, negotiations through strengthened consultation mechanisms, including provisions that require USTR to meet and consult with any interested member of Congress at any time. And it allows any member of Congress to be designated as a congressional <coughs> advisor and to attend negotiating rounds. Should the administration fail to consult with Congress or abide by the procedures outlined in the bill, Congress retains the ability to cut off the fast-track privileges provided under our legislation. Now, our bill ensures that Congress retains clear authority over the scope of the implementing bill as well as enhances congressional oversight over ongoing trade negotiations. It is carefully crafted and balanced package that will enable Congress to, move, to, to 
it's, at least in my opinion, more effectively utilize its constitutional authority to open global markets for U.S. goods and services and grow our economy. No complex, economically significant trade agreement has ever been negotiated by any administration and approved by Congress without trade promotion authority. So how do we make trade work for America? Through a real and meaningful congressional executive partnership embodied through the renewal of TPA. Now sadly, this administration's enthusiasm for TPA seems tepid at best. Despite publicly calling for approval of trade promotion authority in the State of the Union, which the President did and I was sitting there very happy with, President Obama's efforts to achieve its successful consideration have been anemic. Part of this is because of who supports Democrats and part of, which, and part of whom are the members of the free trade unions. For some reason, some of the free, some of the, or excuse me, the members of the trade unions, for some reason, some of our trade union leaders, and maybe I can speak to this better than most Republicans because I actually worked for 10 years in the building and construction trade unions as a skilled, uh, as, a, as a skilled person and appreciated the opportunity that I had. Uh, I was a metal ather. And it was a very skilled trade that gradually worked itself, uh, priced itself right out of the marketplace. But why our union brethren cannot figure out why uh, free trade agreements are important in creating jobs, I'll never understand. Because these free trade agreements are critical to them in the future. Now, it may mean they have to unionize some of the companies that are uh, doing this work, but what's that... Uh, how is that new to them? The fact is it gives them more opportunity and more jobs and more opportunity to unionize. Now, I'm not suggesting the companies should unionize, but I am suggesting that it's crazy for the trade union movement in this country to not recognize the value of free trade agreements. Now, think of Silicon Valley. They're just begging us to get free trade agreements that literally will protect intellectual property interests. And uh, right now, all of you young people understand how important the Internet really is. And we do up on Capitol Hill as well, or should I say many of us do. Many of you can remember the enormous political effort President Clinton put into successful implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. And I'm sure many of you will recall President Bush's political commitment to renewing trade promotion authority in 2002. War rooms were established, and each and every cabinet secretary was expected to make these initiatives a public priority, with good reason. In contrast, TPA was not even mentioned as a priority in President Obama's recent, most recent budget, and his trade representative seems to be relegated to parroting the same bland lines in nominal support of TPA over and over again. Now, by the way, I think Ambassador Froman has the potential of being a great, uh, a great uh, trade leader, but he's got to be unshackled a little bit in order to be able to do some of the things that have to be done. He's got the ability. I have a high respect for him, and I cleared the way that he could be approved, or help clear the way at least. It, 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 but it, actually, I cleared the way. <laughs> I have a great deal of admiration for him, but I don't understand, after the President made this such an important part of his, of his, uh, his, his uh, speech to, to the Congress, I can't understand why he isn't really going ahead and doing this. It will benefit our country greatly, but it will benefit the whole world greatly, too. It will create more freedoms around this world. History shows we need more than vague slogans for TPA to succeed. We need the President's active engagement and support. We need total political commitment from this administration to advancing TPA this year, just like we had in the Clinton and Bush administrations. Without it, without that total political commitment, 
we simply will not succeed. And what nation is going to enter into a free trade agreement with, uh, with us if there isn't uh, TPA? They're not stupid. They understand that without TPA, there's no chance for, uh, for the agreement to ever really be, be successful. So this is really important. It's not too late, I have to say. I believe the bipartisan bill we introduced to renew TPA would gain strong support in the Senate Finance Committee if it were taken up today. I also believe the bill would gain strong bipartisan support in the Senate as a whole if it were allowed to come to a fair vote. Unfortunately, Democratic leadership in the Senate is actively discouraging consideration of TPA. I was very interested in Senator Reid's frivolous comment the day after the President said he wanted TPA that we're not going to do it. Well, I thought that was very interesting. And uh, it shows some of the conflicts that do arise. I suspect that was to satisfy part of the supporters of the Democratic Party. I also suspect that's some, one of the stupidest things they could do. But then again, I'm used to that. <laughs> and as persuasive as, as I am, I'm not nearly as effective as President Obama can be in convincing Democrats that renewing trade negotiating, negotiating authority must be a priority for our great nation, and really for the world. This is not just an American situation, but we're the leaders. And it would help the whole world if we do this. There's still time, and I'm hoping that our president, President Obama, will rise to the challenge. Trade is one area where lofty ideals must join hand in hand with hard work to succeed. As you know, a beehive and the motto, quote, industry, unquote, appear on the state flag of Utah, representing our state's commitment to hard work and progress. I think this is a fitting banner for those who support free trade as well. Support for free trade is not for the political, politically timid or passive. It represents a commitment to stand tall and work hard for economic progress and individual opportunity. In closing, let me just say this. I will work with anyone, Republican or Democrat, to advance our nation's trade agenda. And I know that there are many in Congress who share that very same commitment. We can do this. We've got to have presidential leadership, but we can do this. I'd like to unleash Froman with the power to really do the job that ought to be done for our, for our great country, but even more importantly, maybe in some ways, for the world at large. If we are serious about growing our economy and putting Americans back to work, this is the path that we must follow. It's been a privilege to be with you. I want to thank you all again for inviting me, and I've certainly enjoyed making these remarks with you, and uh, I haven't nearly gotten as, uh, as, uh, as uh, energetic as uh, I really can be on this area. <laughs> so thanks so much. Great to be with you. Thank you, Senator Hatch. Uh, we, we appreciate your being here and appreciate your challenging remarks. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I run the International Business Program here at CSIS, and I'm delighted you all joined us today, and I hope, hope you'll stay for a brief panel discussion of Senator Hatch's remarks. I had to recruit a panel of, of, of true experts and trade policy uh, fans because none of us saw the, the Senator's remarks in advance, so we're all winging this. <laughs> so please, please uh, uh, be gentle with us, but uh, I'm delighted to see you here today. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome uh, to the two old friends of the trade policy community uh, to the rostrum here with me for a discussion on the Senator's remarks and on the path forward on trade policy. Um, Ambassador Iris Shapiro uh, is a, a long time, uh, he's currently the principal of uh, Iris Shapiro's Global Strategies, but a long time trade lawyer, but more importantly, he has uh, the back, both of these gentlemen share a background. Both worked at the United States Trade Representative's Office in a policy position. Both worked in the Senate uh, uh, as Senate committee staffers. Uh, 
Ira was, during the Clinton administration, was general counsel with the rank of ambassador to USTR Mickey Cantor. Uh, prior to USTR, he spent 12 years working in the United States Senate as a staffer, and uh, I would, would note that Ira is a published author. Uh, you can find it on Amazon.com, Ira Shapiro's The Last Great Senate. It's a wonderful narrative of uh, the Senate during the late 1970s, early 80s. And uh, I, I, would, I noted with interest that uh, if you're a fan of House of Cards, in season two, episode two, there's a copy of this book on Frank Underwood's desk. <laughs> so it's a... I commented I was a genius piece of product placement. He, 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 he noted he didn't have anything to do with it. So, but in any case, uh, also here is uh, Mr. Tim Keeler. Tim is a partner at Mayor Brown Law Firm and uh, was, has a similar but time-shifted background to Ira in that he was chief of staff to USTR Susan Schwab during the Bush administration, and prior to that was a member, uh, he was a, worked at the Department of Treasury, also in the Bush administration, but was an international trade staff at the Senate Finance Committee. So both gentlemen bring this unique perspective of having worked in the policy shop at USTR and in the policy shop at the United States Senate, and we're gonna talk today about bridging that gap and creating the partnership that's required to fulfill the goals that Senator Hatch laid out. So let me turn to, uh, in turn to uh, Ira and Tim for opening comments. Ira. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Thank you for the product placement. Uh, and I can't say anything critical about Senator Hatch because he told me how much he liked my book. <laughs> he said it was a little liberal but basically accurate and fair toward him. And I said, but that's because that section was based on your own memoir, Senator. <laughs> um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, today. Um, it seems to me that we're at what uh, James Baker once described as a defining moment with respect to the U.S. position in international trade. Uh, we have, the President and Ambassador Froman have staked out the most ambitious trade agenda in 20 years uh, without yet the evidence that Congress supports it. So that's kind of remarkable. In my view, we have been involved in this country in what I call a 20-year war over trade. If you go back to 1993, Congress support approved the NAFTA after Bill Clinton went all in for an agreement that much of his party hated and the House Democrats, most of the House Democrats opposed. A month after that, the Uruguay round was, was negotiated, although not approved by Congress until the next year in the lame duck session. The Clinton administration, you'll recall, then made one highly publicized trade initiative after another the free trade area of the Americas, the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, a new multilateral round. The assumption seemed to be, I think, that America, with the NAFTA fight done, America's commitment to negotiating future further trade liberalization was inevitable. In fact, what I think of as the 20-year war over trade was just beginning. As you know, Bill Clinton never got trade negotiating authority again, despite asking for it repeatedly and despite the fact that the economy was booming. The next multilateral round, which was supposed to launch in Seattle, crashed amid chaos in the streets and chaos in the convention hall, violence in the streets. 2007, when President Bush was able to negotiate three free trade agreements, Congress didn't even act on them for years, despite the representation and despite the notion that that's what trade negotiating authority was about. You were supposed to guarantee a vote on this. When President Obama became president, understandably focused on other priorities and correctly reading the congressional mood, we had a virtual timeout on trade negotiations. With the exception of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, sort of a modest agreement that began in odd ways, which kind of moved along rather slowly, but still involved only nations that we mainly had free trade agreements with already. 
Ironically, in 2011, if you look at it, at a time when partisan rancor was absolutely at the highest level in Washington, uh, we got through the free, free trade agreements. All of a sudden, Congress took them up and passed them by comfortable margins. And TPP started growing with the addition of Jap Canada and Mexico. And with the addition of Japan, it became an extremely major trade agreement. I would argue the most important trade agreement in the last 20 years. President Obama changed course because of the changes that were occurring in the global economy and the fear that the United States risked being left out and left behind. The Asia-Pacific nations were engaged in economic integration and the United States was on the outside looking in. China was asserting its economic power and offering state capitalism as an alternative model to rules-based open trade. Other nations, from the EU to Mexico to Canada to Australia, were negotiating free trade agreements with their preferred partners. It seems to me that every nation, if you look around, every nation has its own domestic politics that are difficult about trade. But only the United States appears to be regularly paralyzed by our politics. Mike Froman, who's an extraordinarily able trade representative confronts the challenge of completing TPP in the face of strong opposition in the Democratic Party and the near certainty that he will not get everything that our pro-trade business community wants from him. We have a very strong anti-trade movement in this country. The AFL-CIO and other unions make a forceful economic argument, claiming that trade agreements accelerate the movement of jobs from the United States, worsen inequality, and suppress wages for those jobs that remain. Public Citizen and other NGOs criticize trade agreements from another angle. They argue that they undermine the ability of the U.S. to maintain its own health, safety, and environmental standards. I don't think these arguments, particularly the economic arguments, should be dismissed lightly. There's no longer any real doubt that globalization and the rapid development and diffusion of technology, epitomized by the Internet, have contributed to growing inequality in America and everywhere else. Clyde Prestowitz wrote presciently back in 2005 about three billion new capitalists, but I don't think anyone fully anticipated the impact of China's rise in the global economy. But it seems to me that if you take those hard realities, it still leaves us with the question of how to respond. Do we really believe that the United States would be better off watching, standing by while other nations negotiate preferential trade agreements to the disadvantage of our companies, our farmers, and our workers. If trade agreements are so bad for advanced economies, why isn't the concern more widely shared in the EU or in Canada, Japan, or Australia? If China presents a unique challenge with its state capitalism, Shouldn't we be working with other nations to reach agreements that establish trade rules that benefit us and provide incentives for China to change? And by the way, if trade agreements are so harmful to the United States, as some would tell us, why are the governors across the country, Democrats and Republicans, always in favor of trade agreements? They are the ones who have the responsibility for job creation. Public Citizen and the other NGOs believe that our government should decide the level of environmental health and safety protection that we provide to our people. That's not some uniquely American viewpoint. Trade agreements are compromises because none of the nations that we deal with want to sacrifice too much of their sovereignty. If you look at the European Union, and their positions on GMOs or data privacy or chemical regulation or animal rights, 
you're not going to see any rush to trade agreements. The balance is between lowering trade barriers and maintaining control over your domestic legislation to the extent you can. And by the way, does anybody really believe that trade agreements are the reason that the United States can't adopt or maintain environmental or health or safety positions or consumer positions? The last time I looked, the issue was differences among ourselves, differences between the administration and Congress. These aren't the product of trade agreements. From my standpoint, <clears throat> I got involved in trade for the first time 30 years ago, working for Democratic senators at a time when Japan's rise seemed inexorable. Uh, free trade for me was kind of an acquired taste. But over time, I believe that carefully negotiated trade agreements were important tools to opening foreign markets, leveling the playing field, attracting foreign investment, and giving our cutting edge industries and service providers and farmers their advantage around the world. I need to say I'm the chairman of a thing called the National Association of Japan America Societies. From my standpoint, the two nations that have the most skin in the game in TPP are the United States and Japan. It's interesting that our interests have converged. Three years ago, we were quite far apart, and neither country was focused on TPP very strongly. Right now, TPP is essential to the U.S. for integrating us in the Asia Pacific and maintaining and creating high standards. It's essential to Japan. They regard it as almost existential in importance as they've slipped behind Korea and other countries. I think it's incumbent on the U.S. and Japan to work out their differences. And the last thing I'd say, because my opening remarks have probably gone too long, I don't think the administration's view of TPA, support for TPA, is tepid. I think it's politically realistic to recognize that it's going to be very difficult, indeed impossible, to get TPA until Clarity is achieved on TPP. I think the TPP drives TPA at this point. I also believe that the other nations, and I've been in Japan recently, the other nations understand that TPA will come if TPP can be negotiated successfully. So I don't, I understand Senator Hatch's position. I don't share the concern. I think that anyone who's a Capitol Hill veteran, Democratic or Republican, would suggest that we're not going to be able to get TPA before November. And I don't think it stops us from concluding the agreement. I think the fundamental challenge for the United States is figuring out how we actually feel about international trade. I'm told there will be a Pew Research study survey that comes out this week which indicates much more support for global engagement, uh, global economic engagement, than you might gauge by listening to Capitol Hill. So I think that we have to pursue this and bring it to a successful conclusion. Thanks. Tim. Um, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. I very much appreciate it. I'll give some, some brief thoughts, because I do want to get to some Q&A. Um, uh, somewhat in reaction to uh, Senator and, and uh, Iris' comments, but also since um, we're at TSIS, some strategic thoughts about uh, particular TPP, um, or as a former member of the Bush administration, some, some strategy behind um, TPP. Um, it, and it's great to see, I see a lot of friends in the audience that I haven't, uh, some of them I haven't seen in some years, so it's, it's, it's very, very nice to be here. Um, on, the, on the strategic side, you know, the TPP is as much driven, in my view, by important foreign policy considerations as it is uh, economic and, and trade policy. And, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. I mean, much of essentially the development of the GATT was a reflection of uh, impetus in, in, during the Cold War. Um, and it's, uh, it's candidly a lot about China. 
Um, and the President himself said this in uh, the foreign policy debate with uh, Governor Romney, where the two men, if you go back and look at that, it was fairly extraordinary how in-depth they talked about very complicated issues. I never thought in my life I would hear a, a President or presidential candidate talk about an anti-dumping action in another country, but President Obama actually did uh, in the U.S. case against China at the WTO. Um, and, and he particularly mentioned uh, TPP as um, a, a negotiation to essentially keep the U.S. footprint in uh, the Asia Pacific uh, growing and, and not being shoved aside by, by China. And, and that's essentially a complementary aspect to what uh, has, has become a more robust relationship with, with Korea, our longtime ally. China's neighbors uh, have, I think, seen it in the same light and have, um, in addition to, to rushing to the U.S., uh, given the, the tensions in the South China Sea and elsewhere, uh, have rushed to, to view the, the TPP in this, in this fashion. In fact, I think um, there's been a quicker interest of governments to join than anybody expected when this was uh, uh, either um, softly launched by the Bush administration, but also really taken up and, and made robust by the, the Obama administration. Uh, that's not to say that, that this is representative of a new Cold War with China, and it's not to say that it's um, an encirclement uh, of China. It is a hedge, I think, uh, in case the, the assumptions of what has been the bipartisan U.S.-China policy for a long time uh, don't work out as planned. And uh, it's, it's a hedge in the sense of giving us a, a window of, uh, particularly with Vietnam, what uh, if you have a really more robust uh, trade rules-based relationship with a um, with a government that is run by the Communist Party, but has these elements of of capitalism inherent. Um, what can you do to uh, become closer, to improve it, and to bring a, a, a higher degree of freedom to to the people involved? And 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 for all those reasons, it's it's very strategic and a, an incredibly important and worthwhile endeavor. It's also a hedge regarding the in combination with the TTIP negotiations with the EU, to hedge vis-a-vis -vis the BRICS. I mean, if you combine the U.S.'s existing FTAs with TPP member countries with TTIP, you pretty much cover the entire world except for the BRICS and Antarctica. Um, so uh, uh, that is hopefully going to be put pressure on the multilateral systems, the WTO, so that we avoid um, what became essentially a painful bang your head against the wall exercise in Doha where um, countries were talking past each other about what their, what their mutual responsibilities were, were going to be to, to succeed. I was right, the, the, it is a very ambitious trade agenda right now. Um, the trade facilitation agreement was just concluded and that was, I think, clearly a success. The information technology agreement uh, will hopefully be con concluded soon if, if China uh, essentially decides that, uh, uh, th that they want to conclude it. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TTIP, uh, Trade and Services, Plural Lateral, um, you know, this, this has the makings for a very, very robust uh, uh, trade agenda. Um, so let me briefly talk about the issue of TPA and, and TPP. The, um, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg problem that's been uh, bedeviling the, the trade community for a while. Um, I would note that it, it, it probably was a very big missed opportunity to not be able to when um, take what Senator Hatch agreed to with Senator Baucus and, and Congressman Camp and really plow ahead. I mean, it, it's, it's by its nature, when you have a transition of power, that's going to slow things down and that's um, that's what happen, has happened with the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, I think Senator Hatch deserves a lot of credit. Um, uh, he didn't support the May 10th deal that the Bush administration negotiated with Democrats uh, and Republicans in, in the Congress at the time in 2007 when there was uh, an agreement reached on how to more fully incorporate labor, environmental, and, and rights uh, and in, in trade agreements uh, among a number of things. 
Um, he did, if I recall correctly, he didn't v vote for the Peru FTA at the time either, which, which was the first FTA to in include that. So um, that was a uh, sort of underreported, pretty big movement that, that happened. And, um, uh, and obviously, I think there was a presumption that uh, trade adju adjustment assistance, if it were to happen, all these things were happening in this Congress, that would happen. And I don't think if people assume that uh, things can just get held over to the next Congress, that it'll just pick up in the exact same place. Maybe it will, but I don't know that. And, and I think it's um, not necessarily an assumption that should be uh, taken for granted. I mean, negotiations can both go in both directions. I, I will also say, um, on this question of TPP and TPA and can one drive the other, um, I don't, I try not to be a conventional wisdom stale thinker about things, right? So I don't, I, I say never, I don't, I don't use the word never. That being said, it has never happened before in this fashion. And uh, there's a reason that TPA comes first. You get the guidance, you get the structure from Congress, and then uh, when things, when the negotiations are still in play, and then when it comes back, it's subject to the rules and Congress gets to decide whether it met the standard that they asked for. Um, now, I, if you had asked me three years ago, could Congress ever pass three major free trade agreements in one day, you know, on both houses of Congress, I would have said, never, you're crazy, that could never happen. Well, that happened with, with uh, Colombia and Panama and Korea. So I, I take pains to, to never say never. Um, but uh, the, it, it is undoubtedly a new theory to say that um, TPP, and once its contours are clear and known, will be enough to drive TPA um, for purposes of getting TPP done. I, I wouldn't even, I don't, it's still not clear to me what would be the point of, of uh, passing TPP and then passing TPA. If you're going to do it, you might as well just pass TPP directly and, and have TPA be for the uh, whatever whatever hasn't been done. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my, not that the administration wants my advice, but my advice to them is, you know, you really shouldn't wait till the day after the election in November to start thinking what's the president's legacy going to be on these things. Um, that's not to say that Ambassador Froman and others aren't thinking about it, but um, I have seen the end of an administration, and there is a lot of pressure to try to cement um, what a president's legacy will be in a whole number of areas. And even to, to do that in the last uh, two years and three months um, after uh, the, the midterms, you still need to lay the groundwork before then. And so um, I certainly hope that even if TPA is not going to get enacted and signed a law before November, that enough, uh, that additional progress can be made, um, perhaps for final completion in this Congress, or at least to, to get momentum moving again and to continue to get what has to be a bipartisan process um, moving again. It's, um, it, it, it shouldn't be assumed that uh, you can always just pick up where things left off because there's always going to be challenges. It's always going to be difficult from from both the left and the right. So with those, those thoughts, let me let me turn it back to you, Scott. And proceed how you want to proceed. Thank you, Tim. Uh, l let me pose one question to uh, Ira and Tim, and then we'll open it to the to the audience. Uh, my one question is really based on there was good news and bad news in Senator Hatch's comments. Uh, the good news was right up front, and I, I hope you didn't miss it because he, he talked about how engaged with the world, how, how Utah was globally integrated into, into markets. Uh, and I, I, I thought when he said that, I said, you know, Senator, S Senator Reed Smoot wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> and, and it's an important note about how our economy has changed, that an inland state with a large internal economy like Utah is deeply engaged with the world eco economy. In fact, thinking about Ira's comment, 
we probably doubled the share of GDP associated with trade in the U.S. economy since the start of the 20 years war. I think we've gone from about imports and exports being about 15 percent of GDP to today imports and exports are over 30 percent of GDP. So the good news is there's a lot more in, there's a lot more commerce being done globally in the United States. There's a bit, much bigger share of our economic output is connected to the rest of the world. That's helpful to the trade agenda. The bad news was, was in part what Senator Hatch talked about some of the key issues, which made me realize these aren't your father's trade agreements. He mentioned state-owned enterprises, intellectual property, uh, currency, things that are first not the core expertise of the Ways and Means and Finance Committee, and not at least right in their wheelhouse, but second, involve many more equities outside of the committees of jurisdiction. That complicates the legislative process. So the bad news is we have a very complicated path forward for the consideration of either trade promotion authority or trade agreements. And we have a congressional uh, environment right at the moment, which I'd characterize as wait and hurry up. <laughs> they, they tend to do things not at all and then all of a sudden. <laughs> so I'd like Ira and, and, uh, and uh, Tim to both react to the Senator's good news and bad news. <clears throat> Well, the reason I focused a little bit on the history, but also highlighted the strength of the anti-trade movement, is I think the anti-trade movement has been quite strong and effective in creating doubt in the country and on the Hill about the benefits of trade. They can be beaten a mobilized administration with pro-trade advocates on the Hill, with a strong business community, with the governors across the country. There's a formula for winning these kind of battles, but they really have to be waged. You know, for as long as I can remember, the business community has said, we've got to make the case better on the benefits of trade. Well, there's a lot of bright people trying to make that case, and it's not as easy as it is to make the simplistic argument, more simplistic arguments against it. So that's the political dynamic we deal with. The other thing is, this is a very complex trade agreement. Yeah. And, you know, when, when the United States says we're going to have this high standard trade agreement, and that's what everyone's agreed to, and then you end up sort of finding divisions about everything from state-owned enterprises to intellectual property, to a lot of talk about old issues, sugar, dairy, yeah. et cetera. It's a very complex situation. But the one thing I would add, in, in, certainly Tim's right that this isn't the conventional model. When I say TPP drives, has to drive TPA. In my ideal world, the TPA bill would have been ready on the first day at least of 2013, could have been taken up early in 2013, not start talking about it a year later. At the same time, I think Congress is being widely consulted, and I also think that Congress has had an opportunity each time one of the new countries has come in, they've been offered the opportunity to think about what that would mean. They haven't stopped the process, and so I think it has somewhat more legitimacy than, than people would, would, would ordinarily think. Um, well, I'd agree with everything I ever said right there, and um, the only other thought that comes to mind is that, uh, you, you know, there's, there's I, I didn't mean to be too pessimistic about what can happen in the last two years of presidency. Uh, and in particular, the one thing I think Ira left out from the, his, uh, his excellent recitation of what happened um, these past 20 years was uh, following the Clinton administration's failed effort to get um, then fast track, now TBA, um, you know, the president, uh, including from, from Ira's good work, the president, I think you testified before the Senate Finance Committee on Permanent Normal Trade Relations when I was up there for, with China. Um, President Clinton got, uh, you know, negotiated China's accession to the WTO, and and uh, the Congress passed permanent normal trade relations during an election year, the last year of a presidency. Um, so, uh, so hope springs the eternal. The election. <laughs> <laughs> and to, to Tim's point, that was a situation where, in an election year, uh, the Senate 
uh, took up and passed without amendment a House bill. It, it can't happen. It, the, the, the bill passed. Right. It was very painful for us, it, it just was for the record. It was very, very painful. painful. And it, it took, and it, it, it is, it is a, was, in my mind, a demonstration of, of the importance of personal leadership, both from the Clinton administration and from, uh, from uh, two key senators, Bill Roth, the chairman of the committee, and uh, Pat Moynihan, the ranking member. Uh, their personal leadership made that happen. I, I mean, it was not easy and, uh, and not without its complication. Uh, with that, let me open the floor to questions for a few minutes. Uh, there are, I'd like you to remind you of three things, three rules here for questions. First, wait for the microphone. We are live webcasting this, so the audience on the, who's watching online will want to hear your comments, so wait for the microphone to get there. Second, introduce yourself and your organization. And third, I call it the Alex Trebek rule, make sure your question is actually in the form of a question, and not a <laughs> statement. So, yes, Thelma. Uh, thank you. Just, so just a second. Wait for the microphone. I'm breaking all the rules to start with. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Thelma Askey, I've been in the trade field. I'm a senior advisor at CSIS, and I've been in the trade field. And, uh, I'll break the last rule first in that I don't really have a question, but I would just like to <laughs> comment. Um, I, I, I do think that it, it strikes me that the similarities are greater than the differences in how trade policy has worked over the years. Yes. First of all, your last point is that if you try to calculate when the best political time to do a trade agreement is, you will never get there. <laughs> There's uh, trade agreements that have been passed in election years. It's leadership that's the key. Uh, also, Ira, I would tend to disagree with you a bit about you know which goes first because you have examples of both. I mean, the Canada FTA was negotiated almost entirely before trade authority was passed, and then subsequently trade authority was passed for future trade agreements that hadn't even begun. But if the calculation is that you will change the opposition and support for these agreements based on how you structure passing TPA, I, I think that's incorrect also. In the end, whether you have TPA or have the agreement concluded, you will have the same opposition. The, opponents, yes. the, the labor unions will not support a trade agreement. Clinton went all in and succeeded in getting NAFTA passed, but he campaigned against this NAFTA and spent, what, a year and a half, two years, trying to, trying to get a better environment for passing the bill among the opponents, and that eventually had to just go for it. Mm -hmm. So I think you just have to continue to go for it, leadership in the House, leadership in the Senate, leadership particularly in the executive, and, and trying to push both forward and eventually see what needs to be done. You know, maybe t uh, the negotiation needs to proceed a little bit further before the authority, you can be comfortable with the authority. And lastly, Scott, I'll disagree with you. Okay. I think the complication is not more now than it okay. was in past agreements. Different? It's different. Uh, uh, we, you know, going back to when services was first put in the agreement, the complications seemed enormous, and and the authority went way beyond ways and means and finance. But you accomplish it because you build a, a coalition of those who, who are are going to be benefited, as Senator Hatch uh, so aptly outlined. Fair points all. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, Ira or Tim, you want to respond at all? Yes, Bob. Oops. Well, I'm trying to speak to the rules. I'm Bob Vastine. I'm at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. I have a quick question. It, I apologize. It's a little bit, a little bit to the side of the, t the topic, top, the TPA TPP topic, but it's certainly within the ambit of the, uh, of the title of the uh, the program. I'd like the panel's views on appropriate economic sanctions actions vis-a-vis -vis Russia and you, uh, on the R Ukraine issue. What is appropriate um, at this particular time? What is possible? Have you given any thought to that? Well, uh, let me, as a role of, in my role of moderator, say we're, uh, we're, we're watching uh, patiently and the, I would make the one overall point that, that economic sanctions, when they are effective, are coordinated with a broader policy. 
And uh, I would, uh, so I'd ask a prior question, what is our policy toward Russia? And, and within, the, within the, the, the whole context of, of U.S.-Russia policy, where, what is the role of economic sanctions? So sanctions, qua sanctions, uh, is, uh, uh, tend to be, tend to have a boomerang effect. They hurt the U.S. economy, and they also tend to not affect the target of the sanctions particularly well unless they're a fundamental part of a broader strategy. Other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Don Morton with the Alliance for American Manufacturing. Um, thanks for your comments today. This is a question for uh, Mr. Keeler. Uh, you mentioned that TPP is str strategically focused towards China, and I'm curious uh, for your views as to whether we can achieve those strategic objectives without addressing some key non-tariff issues related to China within the agreement, such as currency manipulation and uh, the SOE issues. Um, well, first on the SOE issues, um, I think the answer is yes, uh, that without China in the agreement, it's still um, incredibly useful to get as much done as can be can be done, because essentially it serves as the experiment uh, and the message to China of if you ever want to do a big deal with the U.S., whether it's whatever setting, plurilateral, or, or in, in Geneva, um, this is what the U.S. is going to care about. Um, currency is a much more difficult issue. Uh, it's, it's one thing to, um, it's one thing to say we want to do, address currency manipulation in a trade agreement. It's another thing to get somebody to agree to, another country to agree to it. It's also, so without China in the picture, very difficult to design rules that would govern currency manipulation that would not also apply to the United States or run the risk of it. I mean, they will apply to the United States. So run the risk of us breaking those rules, right? Because amongst TPP members, um, actions that, you know, it, it would be very hard to design neutral rules that where they could be, others could be found to manipulate their currency that wouldn't also apply to actions that the U.S. has taken uh, in the past few years with respect to monetary policy and its effect on the dollar. And the U.S. has found this out sort of the hard way at G20 meetings when they've expected to be able to, to basically isolate China, and particularly Brazil steps in and says, I'm sorry, but if you're flooding the market with dollars from quantitative easing and that has impacts on us, you're pumping money. We don't, we don't see that big of a difference between China's essentially hook to yours. Now, China is different in that you might be able to design rules because they have such unique factors um, in their foreign exchange system that you, you might be able to design rules where you, you could effectively do that. But, you know, if you look at what Japan does, if you look at what the U.S. does, it's a very difficult issue to design it in a way that doesn't raise serious defensive concerns uh, for the U.S. And I don't think anybody would want to create a structure where suddenly we could we could have somebody pointing the you know rules against us on on what has been um, the monetary policy actions of the Federal Reserve whether I agree with it or not I just don't want to see us set, set ourselves up that way so I hope that hope that gives you my views. thank you yes sir thank you hi I'm uh, Ed Barber from GoodWorks International a consultancy founded by Andy Young uh, and before that 43 years in the state and Treasury departments where I had the pleasure of working with a lot of your colleagues and predecessors at USTR um, my question is about the senator's comments on unions I should say at the outset that I have no connection with organized labor so I'm not arguing a brief but uh, and it is indisputable that at a macro level Trade is overwhelmingly beneficial. All the numbers he cited were impressive and true. Uh, from the union point of view, though, it's hard to make the translation from macro to micro. They see jobs going overseas as a result of NAFTA. They see an increasingly hostile environment to labor uh, in the United States. They see uh, a declining share of incomes going to the lower level uh, the, the lower level earners as opposed to higher level. So my question is, how, if at all, do you bridge that gap? 
uh, or is this even an issue that, this is an issue that's been with us for mm -hmm. decades. Is it even a subject that can be addressed in a trade policy context? Sure, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I'm gonna try to answer that, but I wanted just to say that I think Thelma Askey's point was a good one in reminding us that there have been things accomplished in various election years and there are different models that have worked in the past. I think the Canada FTA was a very interesting example. When I talked about the opponents to trade and trying to, to forge some kind of consensus, um, what I was thinking is I really would not like to see a recurrence of the 2002 uh, fast track or negotiating authority which passed by such a narrow margin right. that the bitterness just continued. I'm looking right. for something a little more like 1988, the Omnibus Trade and Competitiveness Act or 1974, et cetera. A somewhat broader consensus that this president and future presidents might be able to rely on. With respect to the union issue, I've been a Democrat all my life and I'm pro-union. The fact of the matter is that there's been a substantial reduction of manufacturing jobs over time, which has to do with a whole lot of things that are not trade agreements. It has to do with globalization generally, technology. but it also has to do with technology. And in my mind, one reason I focus so hard on China is this fact. We peaked at 19 million manufacturing jobs in 1979. We had 16 million manufacturing jobs in 2001. We lost 3 million manufacturing jobs in the next two years and never really recovered them. And to my mind, that suggests that China poses a different kind of issue than anything we've dealt with before. But the other thing I would say is that at a time when we have the, a dramatically changed energy picture, different costs for manufacturing, lower costs than we've had potentially in a long time, I think the chances of maintaining a manufacturing base in the United States are stronger than they've been. And I think that that is in the interest of the unions. And the other thing that has to be said is we're split in this country over the unions. We're split regionally. The only thing as old as me is the Taft-Hartley Act, 1947, born the same year I was. And so we've been split about unions for a honor. long time. Thank you. No, that's actually a very helpful perspective. I mean, I, and I think that the key point I take from Ira is, first of all, uh, two points. One is, I think the Obama administration deserves credit for the outreach they did with organized labor, particularly in the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, uh, which wound up being supported by the United Auto Workers, as I recall. So the, the, this administration does effective outreach. But second, the nature, of, the nature of work, the nature of manufacturing is changing fundamentally, mostly due to technology. And the, the opportunity for a renaissance, particularly driven by unconventional energy, is, is uh, palpable. So I, I hope that our agreements international agreements can help leverage that because I, I actually think the, the climate is much better. I, uh, I grew up in, o, in Ohio in the 1960s and 70s, so I, I remember when manufacturing fell apart and it wasn't all because of trade agreements, uh, but, but it, there, there is a renaissance there. I was recently in Steubenville, Ohio, which is a boom town now thanks to the Utica Shale Formation. So, uh, so things do change and being able to, to come to grips with technology is an important thing. Scott, let me, let me just yes, add on a, quickly to what something Ira said. And I agree that the balance between uh, 2002 and where, where things went for a few years after that was um, too partisan and, and that was, became palpably bad for the, for, for the U.S. and for the U.S. trade national interest. And we did try to correct that with the 2007 agreement, the May 10, 2007 agreement. And it, and it has, uh, it took time, but that, that aspect of it has been successful. The four FTAs that passed after that passed with supportive leadership of both parties. Um, obviously, you know, you had the, what became a temporary 
difficulty over Colombia. But um, it, 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 you know, if you look at the, the number of votes for the, even the three FTAs at the end of the day, they were really overwhelming and, and bipartisan. So, um, you know, I will say organized labor had called for exactly what we basically capitulated on in, in 2007 for years. And uh, to its credit, AFLC, FLCIO went ne neutral, at least on Peru. Uh, and, um, but other unions still vociferously opposed, and AFL uh, eventually ended up opposing other things. Um, you know, the question's a good one, and, and um, I don't know the answer. Uh, you know, blissfully, it's not my job to get the answer right now anymore. Um, <laughs> I did. I did my part. Thanks. One uh, final question. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ren Xiangwei from the Global Policy Group. Uh, the United States is trying to encourage more foreign direct investment at home. And my question is, how could bilateral or multilateral talks with countries like, like China uh, help address some of the difficulties that Chinese enterprises are facing while trying to invest in America? Thank you. Yeah, let, me, let me take a shot. Um, I don't know that it can really address it at all, because the biggest irritant that China usually raises is CFIUS, which is uh, a national security examination, um, and uh, I can assure you no trade agreement is going to be um, going anywhere uh, near those issues. Um, you know, Chinese investors are well served to not try to uh, hide from CFIUS. Uh, I think a lot of the public blowups you've seen on CFIUS has been when 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 uh, companies try to, to hide from it instead of um, uh, uh, being the first one to make the phone call. I, want, I wanted to add on one more point to the earlier issue of, of the shale gas revolution, which I don't, I think the, actually, I, I think there'll be bigger effects on trade policy than people anticipate. I mean, nobody anticipated what these phenomenal numbers of production in the U.S. are um, on, on oil, on, on gas. It's, it's almost mind-boggling, and, and the projections go up every single month. Um, uh, you know, I, I have to think that I'm, I'm not one who frets about the trade deficit for purposes of, of, of the trade deficit. It, 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 my view is it can be a symptom of good things or, or an indicator of bad things. It doesn't, it, it depends on what the context is. But I have to think it's actually going to have a big dent in our trade deficit. I mean, how, yeah. how could it not? I have seen a study that suggests that otherwise, I'm not an economist, it made no it sense to me, but the numbers are just so overwhelming, how can it not? So whether you're talking about as inputs into downstream manufactured goods, whether you're talking about just displacing current imports, whether you're talking about exporting, uh, which I think will eventually happen both on gas and oil, um, that could actually change our, our trade politics uh, quite a bit. It's, 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 it's yeah. these numbers could really change what has been sort of assumed numbers in this debate, so. Great, thank you. Uh, just one follow-up on the, on the China question. I would note that one very important negotiation Senator Hatch did not mention is the negotiation of a bilateral investment treaty between the United States and China. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big big task, but it's very important to both economies. Both have capital export issues, both have capital import issues, and that those treaties have proven over the last 50 years to be a great way to, to bridge the gaps uh, from a substantive standpoint. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank